My name's Charles Matthews, and I'm here today with uh, John Bradshaw of Pick and Pay. Uh, John, I believe you've moved from marketing uh, to omnichannel and e-commerce. Uh, can you tell yeah. us what that means, kind of, and why the move has come about? Firstly, thank you uh, for uh, having me on, and uh, I've been an avid reader of Mark, Mark Lewis during my time uh, heading up marketing at Pick and Pay. Yeah, I recently moved uh, less than a month ago uh, to take over our, or to really create an omni-channel uh, uh, business at, at Pick and Pay that comprises of our e-commerce, which I'm sure we'll talk about. It's been a huge area of growth. Uh, and also our value-added services business and our, our use of technology in stores. For those uh, outside of retail, how would you explain omnichannel, uh, what it is and why it's so uh, important to retail right now? Apart from a terrible word, I really would love uh, people to come up with a better word than, than omnichannel. But I think the idea is that it's more than e-commerce, that actually people like physical stores. I mean, supermarkets are only 120 years old, but they've been extraordinary, extraordinarily successful at helping people meet their needs, their needs to fill up on those daily life consumables that we call groceries. And so I think the reason why we have this concept of omnichannel is saying the physical store does a lot of things really well, but uh, getting your shopping at home when you're on your couch also is, is pretty convenient. And actually there's a whole continuum between them that given we know who you are, we know what you like to buy, we should be able to make whichever way is convenient to you, whether it's shopping in store or getting it delivered at home, we should be able to make that a much, much easier experience. And so Omnichannel is that big challenge that says, don't worry about the channel, just make it easy for me as a customer. How important is e-commerce? I mean, um, I've been looking at your results from uh, 2020 and uh, you showed uh, in a really difficult trading time, uh, came out with excellent results and you showed sales growth of 10% in core food and groceries. How big was e-commerce in all of this? So E-commerce is still a, a pretty small part of our overall offer to customers, but very fast growing. And I think COVID has really accelerated that as lots of people, you know, this time last year, uh, we were still in level five. And really for a lot of people, e-commerce was the best way for them to get groceries, the safest way for, the, for them to get groceries. So I think a lot of people tried it for the first time and they've now added it to their repertoire. You, it'll become in the same way as you have big stores and small stores, we think on demand, scheduled delivery and all kinds of other options will also become an important way in which uh, customers get their grocery needs. Logistics is the back end of this and a very, very important part of getting uh, all the detail in retail right. Uh, what have been the big challenges in logistics over the past year? We set ourselves a goal to be safe, full, open and working as stores. We said if we can deliver those for customers, then we're really serving South Africa. And the hard bit of that on the logistics was full making sure we always had stock on the shelf. So, you know, right at the start, we had the huge run in toilet paper. It was very, you know, we would fill the shelves every day and they would empty every day. Uh, we recovered there. The baking category has never quite recovered. I think people people have been baking the whole way through. So everyone discovered that deep down they needed to make their own sourdough and definitely their own banana bread. We've really, uh, with our partners, done a great job at keeping the shelves full, which has meant this initial panic buying didn't really reoccur in the in the second wave in South Africa because people began to trust the, the retailers and not just pick and pay. Actually, all the retailers, I think, have done a fantastic job with the manufacturer partners of making sure that we keep our citizens fed. Uh, on the logistics side to customers, we've got a few different partners that have been very agile in responding to uh, the need as our online business has grown. And you know whether it's the scooter deliveries or the, the small trucks, I think those partners have managed to flex, have managed to free up capacity from maybe some restaurants that were closed and really having very open collaborative relationships where we're having multiple meetings every week so that we know what their challenges are as soon as they know what their challenges are. And if we both know, then we have a pretty good chance of, of solving them together. One of the worrying things uh, that we read about uh, in the past year was uh, uh, disruptions, particularly uh, disruption, you know, the burning of trucks and that sort of thing, um, and supply chain disruption. And um, how has this affected uh, uh, pick and pay 
And how, despite kind of uh, the disruption that there'd been, did you manage to uh, maintain an on-shelf availability of uh, uh, essential food and groceries at 95%, which is really impressive? We, we sometimes joke that we're not sure a European supply chain would cope. But in South Africa, we build our uh, supply chains rugged. And I, I think both from the manufacturer side and, and from our side, you know, with those disruptions, we know what's going on. We're very collaborative with our manufacturer partners and we get that product through. So it has meant that at times we had to hold a lot more stock um, and that puts pressure on the, on the overall uh, uh, financial performance. But both us and the manufacturers just felt like it was the right thing to do to have that, that insurance. So. One of the most freeing and energizing parts of working for a retailer during COVID has been the ability to focus on what we love doing, which is doing good as good business. We knew if we could just serve customers by staying open, full, safe and working, then our customers would really appreciate that because they were looking for a safe place that they could they could shop and know they would get what they wanted. Reading your annual report, one gets a sense of like, um, like, incredibly strong culture uh, within Pick and Pay, like a very cohesive kind of a, um, and I think that's um, part of what your outgoing uh, CEO, part of like the great work that you did. That's a great observation. And it's uh, interesting that it can come out of something as dry as an annual report. But I think this goes all the way back to the company that Raymond Ackerman built. You know, throughout Pick and Pay, there's, an extraordinary focus on the customers. People just want to do right by the customers, right? And uh, uh, you can see for something like the Cape Town fires that recently happened, right? By the time, by the time senior management know about the Cape Town fires, which is maybe an hour after they start, there are already people from our stores there helping the firemen. Nobody needs to give a central order. It's in the culture. We want to serve our communities. We want to serve our customers. And so that's a pretty special uh, special company to be a part of where actually what you need to do is you need to, the hard bit is to work out how can we afford to serve our customers and communities like we want to? Because one of the huge uh, challenges that you have to face into as a mass retailer is how you get the balance between scale and customization right. You know, scale gives all sorts of benefits. We can offer cheaper products to people because of the scale we, we run at. We can be simpler, which drives our costs down, which drives our prices down at scale. But of course, every customer is different. Every store has different needs. So there's always great benefits as well from customization and, and making sure the offer in an individual store is hyper relevant to its local communities. What are the big uh, customer insights? What are the big changes you've seen of the past year. Yeah, apart from the huge uptake in baking. Uh, no, I think people have, have shopped very differently over, over the, the last year. Uh, it's almost like they went back to shopping how their, their parents used to shop with a big, big monthly shop. As people consolidated their spend, they didn't want to be in the shops as much. Uh, I think they, they went back to big shops less frequently. Big moves in categories, growth in health, uh, growth in, in some convenience. Uh, obviously, a lot of categories closed for much of the year, which uh, resulted in a surge in pineapple sales uh, uh, as we closed liquor. Uh, so all sorts of interesting dynamics for us to uh, keep uh, keep an eye on in, in order to keep keep serving customers. And the big question will be, you know, including the as people have shifted a lot to online is how much of that was a permanent shift of people discovering a better way to optimize their life and how much of it was just the constraints that were placed on people by the regulations and by the way their their lives were how important is your loyalty uh, system to the kind of ecosystem and to understanding mm. customers really important so uh, you know, one of the things that really came through strongly is we've been tracking every week our customers' priorities and how they're feeling. And they've been both very concerned economically and very concerned about them and their family's health over the whole year. But there was only one week in the middle of July, I think, where uh, health concerns were more important than economic concerns in our reading of the customer. And so we uh, introduced smart prices, which is these uh, loyalty prices, we put huge discounts on those kitchen basics, the kitchen cupboard basics uh, uh, through the loyalty card. And we've seen an incredible uptake. We've seen our best year ever for Smart Chopper. 
And so really it is a, an important way of how we deliver value for customers. Uh, you know, we've got a, some strong partners in Time Bank and in BP. I think we're getting better at using it to really make sure that the communication each customer is getting is completely relevant to them. And we're getting much better at using the data and analytics that are now available to make better choices about what is the right range, where should we really work hardest to invest uh, a price, and how uh, you can use the fact that you understand customers well to give them a better shopping experience. Now, uh, why did you do the deal with Time Bank, and what kind of benefits uh, did you get from that, given that they were such a young bank at the time? I mean, from the outside looking in, it looks like the benefit that was accrued was more to time because they've kind of seen huge growth off of them, you know, off that uh, relationship with Second Pay. Yeah, I think it's been a, a great relationship. We like uh, uh, working with startups. We like working with with uh, people who have ideas that sound a little bit crazy because everyone told Raymond Ackerman he was crazy. So we like we like the crazy ones. Uh, and saying, you know, I remember the meeting where they said, uh, we think we can get a million uh, new cardholders. And I was like, well, that feels like a lot. Now they've just hit 3 million. Every one of those cards that people hold, those yellow cards, are smart shopper cards that people use to get their loyalty discounts and earn their points. And I think uh, we're going to grow that relationship. We're going to become better at taking that overlapping customer base and being able to give them extra value. The secret is always, if the partner succeeds and the customer's getting a great offer, then normally pick and pay benefits as well. So on all our big partnerships, we, we're trying to work out how can we make the customer win and the partner win? Because we know if that's both happening, then over the long term, we normally win as well. During your last uh, financial uh, year, in the last results, uh, there's a lot of talk about becoming leaner, becoming more agile, and uh, did this uh, spawn Project Future? And how important has uh, Project uh, Future been in terms of germinating these incredibly innovative ideas uh, that uh, deliver um, like mm. surprising cost savings? You know, we were seeing from all of our customer groups and from our data that we needed to invest in providing our customers more value. There's an old uh, saying that Raymond Ackman took from Bernardo Trujillo, which is uh, uh, poor people need good prices, rich people like them. And I think that's been totally true over the last year as all of our customers have, have searched for, for value. And so that requires us to make sure that every round we spend is a round well spent. And that can be painful to look at uh, where you're spending your, your money today. And I think uh, we've been vindicated by the customer response to the fact that we have invested in, in value. We've gone very single-minded for much of the year in terms of our marketing messages uh, in terms of showing customers the value and delivering the, the value. And customers have uh, voted for us with their feet in their wallet. Who is your biggest competition, uh, Woolworths or Checkers? The truth is, uh, with the uh, market we, we serve, uh, we, we compete with everyone. Okay. Right? We're, we're the guys in the middle uh, with our elbows up. We think we can offer all the way up to the customers who like cold stores, to the customers who really just have a few rand in their wallet and having to, to choose uh, carefully. And I think if we do it well, because of the scale, we can really serve across that spectrum well. Of course, if you do it badly in the middle, you get eaten from every side. What's new in retail? What's kind of coming up? And what does the future of retail look like? I think the future of retail is going to be about lots of little experiments about what works and, and what people value, but it's going to be around providing value, making it easier for people and giving them a, a little bit of adventure and exploration at the fringes so that they can try some, some new things as well. And I, I mean, there's so many interesting experiments going on around the world at the moment. It's going to be interesting to see. I think we've got a great chance to invent it in South Africa because of the diversity of our population. We kind of know a little bit what having a supercomputer in everyone's pocket looks like for the most affluent. You get businesses like Airbnb and Uber, but we don't know what uh, it looks like for the least affluent when everyone has a supercomputer in their pocket, especially if they have data, right? Uh, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how uh, that underserved area of the market uh, uses technology to get value and to get uh, get convenience. I was looking at your, um, what Pick and Pay stands for, and um, there's something that's uh, been kind of core to your purpose from kind of the get-go, and that's research. 
And uh, uh, is purpose important to you? Well, I, it, it really comes uh, to the fore in a time like COVID, where you just realize what an opportunity you had. I mean, I felt so privileged uh, during uh, uh, during uh, the, especially those early days in, in COVID to be able to do something. We knew if we did our jobs well, we would make people's lives better. And that's just the truth of working for pick and pay is that we have 13 million transactions a week. You know, you, you get 1% of 13 million transactions wrong. You have a very busy radio show of people talking about their experience. You get it right and you have this tremendous scale opportunity to improve people's lives. So what does we serve mean? It means we serve the customer. We've always sought uh, consumer sovereignty. How can we uh, serve the customers? It means that as a head office, we serve our stores to help them serve customers. I always warn people when they're interviewing for a job at Pick and Pay. I say, are, are you ready for your bries to change forever? Because you used to just be able to go to a Brian and you say, who do I work for? And no, I work for KPMG. Oh, that's nice. And the conversation moves on. Now uh, you're going to say, I work for Pick and Pay. And people are going to say, I'm so glad I met you. Because last Tuesday I was in Claremont Pick and Pay. And suddenly you're going to be in a conversation about, about retail. And that's the joy of it, right? Uh, it, it impacts everyone's life. And if we do it well, it means that more South Africans can eat healthy food more often. They can have more time to spend with their family. They can have more money to spend on their, their family if we, if we do retail well. And you know, that's what energizes me. It, it's just about uh, the biggest place that I can imagine having uh, impact with my own life is by serving customers through scale retail. Thanks so much, John. It's been great uh, speaking to you. I really appreciate your time. I think it it's, was a tremendous uh, privilege to work in retail over the last year. It's been exciting to be uh, a part of a dedicated team that's really uh, single-mindedly working on how we serve, serve customers. So great to be able to represent a bit of that work with you today. Thank you. And keep well. We'll speak again soon. You too. Great to chat. Cheers, Joel.